everywhere we have deep soil in the world, it was built with herbivores and perennials, periodic disturbance, hmm. and rest cycles. That, that's how soils have been, I mean, the American buffalo, the, the bison built the soils that we're still mining with corn and soybeans. You know, I mean, that, that's the, that created the savings account that we're still drawing on today. And so our farm actually had many, many areas that had so little soil that we couldn't even hold up an electric fence stake. I mean, it was just no soil. Wow. And so in, in 51 years, all of those big areas that were just bare rock when I was a child now have 12 inches of soil on top of them. We're going to reintegrate ourselves in our food and energy system. So we're going to see patio gardens, beehives on the roof, edible landscaping instead of just ornamental landscaping. Okay. And, and, and we're going to integrate our food system into our lives rather than segregate our food system into, you know, pushed away sectors that are opaque and out there somewhere. We're going to localize food instead of globalize food. And we're going to be able to nest ourselves in the profound grace and abundance of this community of beings that wants to embrace us and dance and be our friend. That's going to be the future. This is Peak Moment. We are living at a peak of human innovation, information, wealth, and health. But we're also at a peak of population and consumption with rising temperatures and declining resources fueled by cheap oil and gas. Peak Moment Television, bringing you examples of positive responses to energy decline and climate change through local community action. Hi, welcome to Peak Moment. I'm Jenea Donaldson. In 2006, we were privileged to tape a show with Joel Salatin of Polyface Farms, and I am so pleased to get to talk to you again now. Great. Joel, you... I. I I was so impressed because your examples from your farm, Polyface Farms, of the compassion you have with your animals, the way you're regenerating soil, um, making a living at it, keeping sure. it, I mean, it was like a real model, mm -hmm. I think, of sustainable agriculture. Tell us what you do there and sure. how that fits into the picture of what sustainable agriculture is. Well, what we do there is, um, well, our, our, our basis is pasture-based livestock, <clears throat> and so we have we have chickens, we have turkeys, chickens both meat and egg layers, turkeys, pigs, cows, rabbits. We have a lot of forests, so we do, we have a sawmill, we, we mill lumber as well, and a big garden. So uh, we essentially grow all of our own food, but what we mainly sell is the, is the animals. And um, everything is based on pasture. We move everything every day. And to new pasture, so it, the, the infrastructure is portable, portable shelters, mm -hmm. hoop houses, egg mobiles, you know, all this portable infrastructure. <clears throat> and our fertility program is based on carbon cycling on site with uh, com big, you know, large composting, which we do with piggerators. Pig we, wait a minute, a piggerator? Yeah. What's a piggerator? Well, a piggerator is, um, is a pig that we introduce to this deep bedding pack. Uh, with, with fermented corn in it okay. that's, that's been building over the winter with the cows. You know, it was like a carbonaceous diaper under the cows. Oh, my god! Yeah, because cows aren't potty trained, you know, and they're, they're dropping <laughs> 50 pounds of manure and urine every day, okay. which is highly either if it gets wet, it wants to leach, and if it gets dry, it wants to vaporize. All right, all right. <clears throat> we all know what that smells like. And so during the, during the hay feeding time, we, we soak up all of those nutrients that black gold, we call it, right, right, um, right. with, with a, a carbonaceous diaper, wood chips, sawdust, old hay, straw, you know, any kind of mm -hmm. carbonaceous material. We add corn to it. The cows tromp out the oxygen so that that whole bedding pack ferments. And then when the cows go out, we put in the pigs. And if you've ever noticed a pig, a pig has a sign on the front end of his face. It says, we'll work for corn. <laughs> <laughs> and so the pigs then seek out the fermented corn in the bedding and in doing so, they fluff it, aerate it, hits pig aerators, like aerobic dance, you know, okay, and okay. inject oxygen and convert it from anaerobic fermentation to aerobic compost. And that's, that's the heart of our fertility program. And so the compost goes, and then where does that go? Compost goes back out on the fields okay. to, to, to be the fertilizer. But the point is that it is, a, it is an on-farm generated carbon cycling program. And, and um, you know, that is, a, that is a huge break from, 
from today's you know, uh, modern idea of farming is that fertility comes from somewhere else. Okay, yeah. And, but, Chemical but, fertilizers that's right, and, that's right. and other, yeah, other nutrients. Petroleum-based, chemically-based fertilizer see, from off-farm. Our idea is, in, in, in mimicry of nature's template, mm -hmm. is that fertility soil is built from on-farm, solar-generated biomass that then decomposes on-site. Nature doesn't ship carbon very far. You know, it it's stays, right it stays where it is, pretty where it falls, right? right. Leaves and, and bark right. and, yeah, okay. And, and, and manure. Right, okay. And I mean, that's one of the big reasons for animals. In, that's why there's no animal-less ecosystem is because animals are the only way nature has to defy the gravitational uh, movement of fertility from the, the ridges and the hills down into the fertile valleys. Without animals, you can't, you can't harvest and move that fertility back up to the top of the hill. Oh, of course, of course. I, that's part of what I love is you're, you're mimicking nature. I, I, you right. know, explain to us, <clears throat> explain to folks how, you, how, how the animals that go in, in phases. Sure, so, well, the, the, the cows, the cows are moved every day to a new, you know, a new paddock, a new pasture spot. Grass. Grass. The native yes. grasses, yes. whatever. Yes, that's right. Okay. Whatever grows, grows. We haven't planted a seed in 50 years. <sighs> so, so, you know, whatever's there is there. And um, we call it nativized, nativized okay, pasture. Okay. Okay. And so the cows get moved every day. Well, two or three days behind the cows, we move in the laying hens that free range out from egg mobiles, and the chickens then scratch through the cow patties um, and and eat the fly larvae and spread the cow patties out to to stimulate fertilization. So the cow patty, instead of covering one little spot, it covers mm -hmm. a great big spot, mm -hmm. and um, and that, that's part of the fertility program. And all this is, is just looking at nature, at the birds that follow herbivores in nature. You know, if you look at the Serengeti or, you know, the egret on the rhino's nose, the, the uh, birds that follow the Cape buffalo in Botswana. In nature, all herbivorous herds are, are full of, of birds all around them who, who perform this function. So this is not new. We're just looking at nature saying, well, you know, how does nature do this? Okay. And, and we're just kind of taking scissors and cutting out of that pattern, mm -hmm. if you will, mm -hmm. and taking that pattern and saying, how do we duplicate this on a commercial domestic farm, on a commercial domestic model? And so how, how well have you done at building the soil? I mean, where did you start with? Because oh that's, my. Yeah. you know, desert seem to follow us wherever we do that's, agriculture. That, that's and, correct. And is that happening that's with correct. yours? That's correct, and trust me, you know, I everywhere I go, I repent in sackcloth and ashes for all the damage that that farmers and mm. cows have done. But everywhere we have deep soil in the world, it was built with herbivores and perennials, periodic disturbance, mm. and rest cycles. That's that's how soils have been. I mean, the American buffalo, the the bison built the soils that we're still mining with corn and soybeans. You know, I mean, that, that's the, that created the savings account that we're still drawing on today. Um, so when we came to the farm in 1961, uh, you know, the farm had lost anywhere from three to five feet of topsoil oh. over the 200 years. I mean, remember, this is, you know, this is old country. I mean, you know, Europeans came to this and began abusing it long before they came to California and began abusing it. Okay. Are you with me? Yeah, yeah. And yeah. So, so we're, you know, we're 100 years ahead in our abuse <laughs> than California is. And so our soils are older, they're more eroded, they've been abused more. And so our farm actually had many, many areas that had so little soil that we couldn't even hold up an electric fence stake. I mean, there was just no soil. Wow. And so in, in 51 years, uh, there will be 51 years this, this year uh, that we've been there, all of those big areas that were just bare rock when I was a child now have 12 inches of soil on top of them. So there's our hope of being Absolutely. able to have regenerative agriculture, not just... Absolutely. Yeah, we, if, if farming is done correctly, it should actually build soil. You know, we have this idea that, that civilization destroys soil, and too often it does, so I'm, I, I, I get that, um, and that farming destroys soil. I mean, the whole westward expansion in our culture's history was fueled by wearing out farms on the East Coast and constantly having to move west because we wore out farms on the East Coast. 
and, and finally we hit the Pacific. I was going to say, we've run out of, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and that's why in about 1900, you know, when we hit the Pacific, um, then there was this huge American and worldwide, uh, uh, what, you know, consternation. Oh, no, what are we going to do? There's, there's no more land because Australia hit it about the same time. You know, Australia and that, those, the U.S. and Australia were the, were the two final kind of, you know, frontiers uh, that, that, that uh, got exploited. What are we going to do? And so, of course, that started this quest for, well, the, how do we build soil? And you had two schools of thought. One was the basic, the chemical approach, that soil is fundamentally a, a mechanical thing. And then, uh, you know, and, and that was, of course, nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus, uh, chemically based, you know, um, manufactured, artificial, if you will. And uh, then you had the other school of thought, which viewed soil as primarily a biological community of beings with physical structure, and, um, and, and that was, of course, led by the early proponents of biological farming. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Which is what the, you're doing. A, absolutely. Which the chief proponent, of course, was Sir Albert Howard, oh. who, who developed modern uh, scientific aerobic composting and brought it to the world in 1943 in his, you know, still, you know, still considered kind of the, the, the foundation, the, the cornerstone of the biological farming. Uh, his book, An Agricultural Testament. And he did all of his you know, life's work in India. And so I, I think it's, it's interesting for most people to realize that actually scientific composting is only as old as chemical agriculture. The two actually were developed kind of at the same time. But, but the chemical agriculture enjoyed more, uh, more it, it enjoyed the war effort Sure. You know, because sure. we make bombs yeah. out of NP and K as well. And so, so ba basically the Pentagon, the war effort, um, paid for the, the chemistry, the laboratories, the distribution, you know, the, wow. the, the factory, the, the efficient production of, the mining of, of the NP and K fertilization. And so it took about 20 or 30 years for composting to, to develop its supportive infrastructure mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm, and, and mm -hmm. protocols. Um, the image I get, Joel, is we took the war effort to create the bombs and those chemicals, yes. and we are, isn't agriculture, industrial agriculture, a war on what, soil? A absolutely, it's, I mean, it's it, it, is, it is a war on that community of beings, absolutely. Absolutely, you know, and, and so when people ask me, you know, can we feed the world, not only can we feed the world with a biological approach, um, but the fact is that if we had had a Manhattan Project for compost, not only would we have fed the world, but we would have done it without three-legged salamanders, four-legged frogs, mm -hmm. and, and a dead zone the size of New Jersey in the Gulf of Mexico. Wow. That's the truth. Wow. But, wow. you know, all innovation has a, has a kind of ragged edge, you know, and it takes a while for everything to develop. And so it was almost like in 1945, you know, a new starting gun went off for this race, but, but the chemical folks had, had two laps a head start around the track yes. because we'd spent millions of dollars developing NP and K, you know, uh, um, knowledge. I want to go back to a question here. Uh, when we did the vegetarian myth, one of the things that Lear Keith said was that a vegan or a vegetable plant only life um, diet isn't healthy for humans and it's also not sustainable for agriculture. And I wonder what you think about that since you know animals are part of your operation. Sure, sure. Well, um, a couple things. One is that, um, that a, a perennially based system, mm -hmm. and, and perennials as opposed to annuals, you, you know, in other words, a perennial is, an, is a plant that, that lives year after year after year. Okay. An annual is something that has a, an annual, it has to make a seed, and it dies, and then the seed has to be planted next year for another. Which is what we, most of our we, agriculture All our grains, is. grains, uh, cotton, okay, well, everything we subsidize <laughs> okay. is an annual, okay. Okay. okay? Well, the fact is, nature has almost no annuals. I mean, who's there to plant it? Okay. Okay. So there's almost no annual in nature. All right. Nature builds soils with perennials. Mm -hmm. All right. Now the perennial is, and that's why all historic, you know, crop rotations included four to five years of perennials of pasture. Okay. Sandwiched between one or two years of annuals, because annuals deplete the soil 
and perennials build the soil. Because annuals put all their energy in a, in a grain crop, something that you can take off and take away. Perennials, because they do live a long time, put their energy in a root structure so that it so that it can be so that the top can be grazed or burned or whatever, and the plant still lives. <clears throat> and so, um, so perennials are soil builders. Annuals generally tend to be soil uh, depleters. Okay. And and it's it's the animal, it's the herbivore, mm. it's the herbivore that is that what I call is is the pruner, just like you would prune an orchard or prune a, a vineyard to stimulate verdant, luxuriant growth, the herbivore prunes the perennial so that it can restart its fast juvenile growth stage and metabolize more solar energy into decomposable biomass. Absent the herbivore, the plant just grows, goes into senescence and collapses, and the photosynthetic activity stops. And so, so I, I call the herbivore uh, nature's biomass accumulation restart button. <laughs> okay, <laughs> to yeah. prune it back to restart the metabolic okay. capacity, okay. and that's why herbivores, in conjunction with perennials, grasses, forages, that's why those build soil over time. So for us to really have, well, okay, that, that gets into the question of what's a sustainable diet then? It's going to have to include eating some of the herbivores or... Well, yes, yes, and, and, and that's, that's exactly why all the ancient, you know, the, the, the traditional uh, diets were, if you, were either heavy on an herbivore, you know, whether it was a yak, uh, uh, a, 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 a buffalo, a... Um, what, you know, a camel, <laughs> all right? <laughs> but it was always about an herbivore, and of course those are mammals that make milk, sheep, okay. all right, goats, all right? right. So it was, right. it was always herb herbivorous, or it was seafood, because those were the only things in, in historically that were nutrient dense that didn't require tillage. In a day when, when, when tillage required, you know, walking behind an ox or a yak with a sharp stick all day to till the soil and then hand plant seed, hand harvest it, and then try to, try to um, uh, keep it away from mice and rats for a year before, before sheet metal and, and mesh, <laughs> all right, grain was very, very, very expensive. Tillage was very expensive. Grain was expensive. And so, and, and so we needed all the grain we could have for, for human consumption, for baking, for bread and things like that. But um, uh, but now, of course, with cheap energy, you know, we can we can plow up everything, and those historic boundaries of soil tillage that kept us from being able to destroy things too fast. Now we can destroy it way faster. And we're looking at a lower energy future. Absolutely, I mean, with oil. And in so a time of energy descent, that's my whole point. Uh, in, in energy descent we will be moving back to that expensive grain uh, mm. paradigm. Mm. And indeed, we already see it. We're already seeing it in our culture, you know, with, with, with heightening food prices. Sure. And, and, and yet people are saying, but can you feed this population on herbivores and chicken and meat oh, and so on? Absolutely. The, the, you know, an, an acre of grass, an acre of perennials, is far more productive than an acre of grain. If it's managed with high-tech electric fencing and biomimicry and this moving, mobbing, mowing that we see the way the, the, the prey-predator herbivore-wolf relationship occurs in nature. So uh, absolutely, it's, it's, it's with, with, with intensive management, with high-tech infrastructure that allows us to actually, you know, mm -hmm. to actually mm -hmm. duplicate mm -hmm. even better than nature did with wolves and, and bison, we can do that even better with electric fencing and cows. Well, not everybody is going to be able to do what you're doing in your Absolutely. farm, but, but where can people start to move? I mean, you're talking about local food. Uh, you know, you're not going to be able to get it across the world. Yeah, how absolutely. Do, where well, do people start? Well, um, where a person starts, in my opinion, is, is to get in their kitchen. Uh, there's nothing more liberating than, to, um, than to, to prepare, package, and preserve your own raw food, your own uh, unprocessed food. You know, the, the thing... The thing that's um, that's really driving our whole food system in this country is 
is processed food. And, and so if you, if you go and find your farmer, go to farmer's market, join a CSA, um, but, but participate, here's my challenge. The answer requires a lot of people, a lot more people to participate in their food. Today, we've got more people interested in the latest belly button piercing and Hollywood celebrity culture <laughs> than, than what's going to become flesh of their flesh and bone of their bones at 6 o'clock. And until we have people who want to participate viscerally, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, touch eating it, it, eat, 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 right, smell it, right, right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and participate viscerally in their food production, um, we will not have an integrity food system and, and a secure uh, food system. So it's going to take more participating eyes, ears, noses, hands, mm -hmm, feet mm -hmm, uh, in mm -hmm, the food system mm -hmm. to get us where we want to go. So partly I hear, yeah, get in the kitchen and, and, and discover that and find your local sources of and support Absolutely. those local sources of Every food. Every area is surrounded by what I call farm treasures. Uh, and they're desperate for market share. They're desperate for people to, to, to come and patronize them as an alternative to, to the, the factory farms, all right, whether they're tomato factory farms or pig factory yeah, farms. Yeah. And so it doesn't take an act of Congress. It doesn't take, you know, picketing anybody. It doesn't take, um, you know, a, a grant program. Every day we can decide to participate in this amazing community of beings that's in us, three trillion bacteria, in the soil, two trillion per handful, wow. and all around us and on our skin and in us. This is an amazing invisible community of beings that we're immersed in like an ecological womb. We can either massage it and participate in it, or we can spurn it and say, ooh, you're yucky and dirty, and I'm not going to participate. And wherever we are in the next 20 years will be the, the, the sum total, the, the, the physical manifestation of the billions of decisions that we make between now and then, just like where we are today, is the culmination of billions of decisions we've made for the last several decades. In our last four minutes, you've got a new book out. I do. Folks, It Ain't Normal. Yes. Great title. Sounds so like you. Uh -huh. Tell us about what's in it. Sure. Folks, this ain't normal. It, the, the, the thesis is, is essentially that, um, that where, where we're headed is, is uh, unsustainable. We, we cannot, you know, we've got energy problems, we've got health problems, we've got soil depletion problems, air problems, water problems, nutrition problems, um, goodness, uh, emotional problems, mental problems. We've got a lot of issues that, that are happening. And, and um, I don't think that we're going to be so clever and scientific and technologically advanced in our civilization that we're going to be able to continue to live with such a profound abdication of historically normal visceral relationships with the processes of living. And, and, and so as we go into the future, we're going... Uh, I think that a sustainable future means we have to look at the past and say, okay, what were the glues? What were the patterns that, that held civilizations yeah. together? And we're going to have to, we're not going to go back to ringer washers and hoop skirts and, you know, Dutch <laughs> oven cooking, all right? <laughs> you know, but we're going we're gonna to go into the future, where, you know, these principles are, well, we're going to move to a more perennially, perennially based agriculture. We've already discussed right. that. Right. We're going to move back into our kitchens mm -hmm. with bread makers and timed cook and, and uh, you know, time bake and slow cookers. <clears throat> we're going to, we're going to reintegrate ourselves in our food and energy system. So we're going to see patio gardens, beehives on the roof, edible landscaping instead of just ornamental landscaping. Okay. And, and, and we're going to integrate our food system into our lives rather than segregate our food system into, you know, pushed away sectors that are opaque and out there somewhere while we buy People magazine and, 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 and open the box while we're, you know, uh, reading and stick it in the microwave to nuke dinner from who knows where. We're going to localize food instead of globalize food, and we're going to be able to nest ourselves in the profound grace and abundance of this community of beings that wants to embrace us and dance and be our friend. 
That's going to be the future. Joel, I sign me up. That's I thank you for paving the way for that. I, I want to say that your work and the work of Weston Price has touched us. Sure. So having local raw milk and local mm. grass-fed beef and so on, I mean right. it's changed our vitality and our relationships here. Sure, absolutely. You know, and thank you to, to you and you know your cohorts for saying this this is this is crazy yeah. what we are what we are doing. And thank you for just being on that bandwagon and telling everybody. Well, thank you for your participation. Yeah. We, you know, we're not going to say we're not going to be the civilization that sails off into some Star Trek future, um, uh, severing this historical ecological umbilical. We're still attached. We're still completely dependent yeah. on this community of beings that's in us, around us, under us, and 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 us. And and so, you know, we 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 need to learn to embrace it, live with us live with it and massage it and nurture it as a friend. Oh, trillion bacteria. That's I right. love it. Okay. That's right. You're watching Peak Moment. I'm Janae Donaldson. My guest is Joel Salzman. Isn't he shaping the future that you want for your food? See you next time.